Hello, Amberley Publishing have given me permission to read a few extracts from some of my books to hopefully alleviate some of the lockdown boredom. So I'm going to start with the first book that I wrote for them, which is about the Wars of the Roses. And I'm going to read a chapter uh, called The Pirate Earl, which deals with the aftermath of Edward IV's return from exile and the battles of Barnet and Tewkesbury. Chapter 17, The Pirate Earl. The first of the irreconcilable Lancastrians to break ranks was John de Vere, Earl of Oxford. Not quite twenty when his father and eldest brother had been executed by John Tiptoft, making him the head of the family, John had initially been attainted, but Edward IV later relented, allowing him to take possession of the earldom in 1464. In 1465, he officiated at Elizabeth Woodville's coronation, acting as her chamberlain. In spite of this, it's likely that Oxford's loyalty was always suspected, and when trouble began in 1468, he was swiftly arrested and imprisoned within the tower. Released in early 1469, by the middle of the year, he had joined Warwick and Clarence in their efforts to remove Edward, perhaps reminded of the treatment that the king had meted out to his father and brother. The re-adeption of Henry VI saw Oxford carrying the sword of state for Henry's re-coronation on the 13th of October 1470. Appointed Constable of England in place of John Tiptoft, Oxford oversaw the trial and execution of the man who had condemned his father and brother. When Edward IV attempted to return, it was Oxford's men, led by his brother Thomas, who prevented the Yorkists from landing in Norfolk. Unlike many staunch Lancastrians, Oxford didn't balk at following Warwick, and his flank performed extremely well at Barnet, routing his opposite number, but then losing discipline as they celebrated their victory prematurely. When Oxford returned to the battlefield, it was to chaos as his men were mistaken for Yorkist forces and attacked. Amid cries of treason, he finally fled the battlefield and rode north. Remaining in Scotland for only a short period, Oxford sailed to France, by which time Margaret had left and her cause lay broken in a field outside Tewkesbury. Edward IV was now fully restored and all of Oxford's allies, Lancastrians and Nevilles, were gone. Although remembered as the archetypal Lancastrian, John de Vere's alliances were less than clear during the period surrounding the re John had married Margaret Neville, sister of Richard Earl of Warwick, and his early involvement in Warwick and Clarence's plans to unseat Edward in favour of his younger brother suggests that not only was he fixated upon a Lancastrian restoration, but the removal of Edward was his primary concern. In the aftermath of his recapture of the kingdom, Edward IV had much to deal with. A Lancastrian state had undone some of his work over the previous decade, and law and order had to be restored to a country that had become too used to the lawlessness of civil war that presented opportunities for advantage to the unscrupulous. Edward had suffered dethronement, at least in part because he had not been able to end, once and for all, the troubles within this kingdom. He was determined not to make the same mistakes again. Edward's second rule was a much more assured, mature and confident affair, but it wasn't without its problems. In October 1472, Edward summoned Parliament. With so much business to deal with, it was to sit for a total of 44 weeks over the next two and a half years. The length of this Parliament sitting was a record that wouldn't be broken until Henry VIII's Reformation Parliament. The immense Warwick patrimony preoccupied much of the early sessions. Richard Neville had been in possession of the vast wealth and lands of the Neville family, but he also held the Beecham and Dispenser inheritances that had been his wife's. From these, he had taken the Warwick title by which he is remembered. In the time between Warwick's death and Parliament convening, the King's youngest brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, had married Anne Neville, the younger daughter of Warwick and widow of Edward, Prince of Wales, next to whom he had sat at George Neville's investiture feast. With Edward's other brother, George, already married to Warwick's older daughter, Isabel, the real issue was how the lands would be divided between them. Richard had, since 1471, been in effective possession of huge tracts of Neville land in the north, and it seems clear that Edward intended it to stay that way. His marriage to Anne simply made the grant more acceptable and brought in the loyalties of the Neville affinity there. This would leave the Western Midlands and southwestern properties to George. There was bitter disagreement between the brothers as to the precise settlement of the lands, but throughout they remained united in one thing. Both men wished to have the title to their lands in Juriuxoris, in right of their wives, rather than as a fresh royal grant, 
The advantages of this were instantly clear for George and Richard. If they obtained their titles by grant of the king, Edward could just as easily take them away again. If they were held by inheritance, then the rights of them and their wives were protected by law, offering a greater measure of independence from the king. It was a thin slither of a cord, but Edward seized upon it, though it presented problems of its own with the creation of mighty men within his kingdom again, but it must have seemed unavoidable. The first issue was that Warwick could not be attainted, since this punishment would mean the confiscation of his lands and titles. If Warwick could not be punished, neither could his confederates. Warwick's widow was still alive, and so her lands were not yet free to be passed to her daughters. If she remarried, a new husband would gain legal control of her estates. The final issue was that the Neville inheritance was legally bound to the male line, so Isabel and Anne were not, in fact, their father's heirs. The entire vast inheritance legally belonged to George Neville, Duke of Bedford, the son of John, Marquis of Montague. Edward's solution managed to be unsatisfactory, inequitable, shabby, and a seed that would grow to contribute to the undoing of his house. Warwick's widow, Anne Beecham, Dowager Countess of Warwick, was dispossessed, declared by Parliament to be dead in legal terms, so that her daughters could take their inheritance as though she had died. George Neville was then also disinherited. The details of the dissection of Warwick's estates were completed in February 1473, and Richard's grant was made by Parliament on the 23rd of February, with George's seal the following day. To the very end of both grants, Edward attached a condition to their title, limiting their independent enjoyment of their new acquisitions. Also, it is ordained by the said authority that if the said male issue begotten or coming of the body of the said John Neville, knight, die without male issue coming of their bodies, while the said duke is alive, that the said duke shall then have and enjoy all the things stated for term of life. Edward tied his brother's titles to the male issue of John Neville, so that they would only hold their lands and titles for as long as a Neville male heir existed. This meant that if George Neville or his line were to fail, both dukes would only retain a life interest in their properties, which would pass to the crown when they died, and not to their children. None of this was ideal for any party. Edward may have believed that he was solving a problem, but instead he had stored up trouble for later. As part of the post-Lancastrian restructure, King Edward also granted his loyal youngest brother the lands of the Earl of Oxford. The Earl's lands were forfeited without attainder, but his mother held a substantial portion of the lands in her own right. Now about 60 years of age, the Dowager Countess was living in a nunnery at stratford le -Beau. She had tied up her lands, perhaps fearful of the constant uncertainty that prevailed and the poor conditions of her family under Yorkist rule, placing them in the hands of Fifi's, who enjoyed the freehold of the land, but paid the Countess a fee while she retained the right to control who the lands passed to. This meant that she could leave her property to whomever she wished after her death, rather than it passing immediately to her oldest son. With four surviving sons and three daughters, she may have meant to provide for her other children, since John had already acquired the main Oxford inheritance. Perhaps she even intended to endow the nunnery that currently provided care for her. In December 1472, Richard paid the Dowager Countess a visit, but it was not a friendly one. He instructed her to sign over her lands to him immediately, removing her from the nunnery to his own household, then at Stepney. The Countess was moved again shortly afterwards to Walbrook, and finally agreed to sign the papers. She later told one of her fifis that Richard had threatened to move her to Midland Castle in Yorkshire if she didn't, explaining that she feared the journey and the freezing northern winter would be the death of her. Richard secured the land, the papers finally signed in January 1473, but he had bullied an elderly lady to get them. John de Vere had been engaged in piracy in the English Channel since shortly after his arrival in France. He spent almost two years raiding Calais, harassing English shipping and stealing from merchants. The Earl appears to have made a good living for himself as a pirate, while simultaneously causing trouble for his enemy Edward IV. In May 1473, he radically altered his tactics, and it's likely that his mother's rough treatment contributed to his decision to act more directly. George Neville, Archbishop of York, was to find himself another victim of Edward's determination to sweep the kingdom clean. The Archbishop didn't possess the military might to threaten Edward, but he was a wealthy and influential man. He had made peace with Edward 
handing the capital and King Henry over in 1471. A little while later, Warkworth recorded that he became the focus of Edward's efforts to ensure his own security. In 1472, George was at Windsor with the king, enjoying the hunting, high in the favour of the restored king and bucking the fate of his brothers. Edward told the archbishop that he would do him the honour of visiting his manor at Moor to sample the hunting there, and George, overcome with excitement, hurried home to make preparations. He called for all of his plate and the goods that he had placed into hiding after Barnet and Tewkesbury, and borrowed heavily to make ready to receive the king. He purchased enough food and drink for his visitors to stay for several days, and awaited the king's arrival on the appointed day in April. The day before Edward was due to arrive, a messenger brought a summons for George to go instead to the king at Windsor immediately. The Archbishop obliged, and on his arrival found himself arrested for high treason, charged with aiding John de Vere, Earl of Oxford. Sending George across the channel to Ham's Castle at Calais, an unlikely destination for one genuinely suspected of assisting a pirate rebel at large in the channel and frequently attacking Calais, Edward dispatched several of his men to Moor, where they seized all of the Archbishop's neatly gathered treasure. His properties were transferred to Edward, his mitre was broken and the jewels used to make a new crown for Edward. Much of the wealth was passed to the infant Prince Edward, the King's son and heir. What George Neville had so carefully built over decades was lost in a single day. Although he was released in 1475, George died in poverty and disgrace the following year. Oxford attempted to land an invasion force on the Essex coast near St Osseth in May 1473 but was repelled. Sailing west along the coast, he eventually arrived at St Michael's Mount, just off the southern tip of Cornwall. Set atop a tidal island, St Michael's Mount is the English counterpart of the French Mont Saint-Michel. At low tide, there's a beach connecting the fortress perched atop a rocky mount to the mainland, but at high tide, it becomes an island with no bridge connecting it. John, along with 80 other men, including two of his brothers, seized the monastery and dug themselves in. Precisely what John hoped to achieve is worth considering, with Lancastrian hope long gone. It's feasible that he was seeking to resurrect the previous alliance with George, Duke of Clarence, whom he believed could still be tempted to topple Edward, having come into possession of his own large Warwick portion. In September, word reached Edward that Oxford was moving about Cornwall and was receiving a warm welcome. The King sent orders to Sir Henry Bodrigan, chief landowner in the area, to lay siege to St Michael's Mount and deal with Oxford. Bodrigan duly did as he was instructed, but each day at low tide the Earl of Oxford's men would come out of St Michael's Mount under a flag of truce to parley with Bodrigan before returning to the security of the fortress, which Warkworth claimed could be defended by 20 men against all the world for as long as their provisions lasted. Eventually, on one of his forays out of St Michael's Mount, Oxford complained that his provisions were running low. At this, Bodrigan had fresh supplies brought to the Earl and the mount was restocked. When Edward heard of Bodrigan's mismanagement of the siege, he was furious and sent one of his squires of the body to replace Sir Henry. When Richard Fortescue arrived at the end of December, he met angry resistance from Bodrigan but laid siege to the mount. Almost every day the two sides fought, Fortescue losing men and occasional truces being called for a day or two. During the truces, Oxford's men were offered pardons and grants of land if they would abandon the Earl, so that finally less than a dozen were willing to stay with Oxford. On the 15th of February 1474, Oxford was forced to surrender St Michael's Mount. When Fortescue entered, he found enough provisions to have lasted many more months. Warkworth believed that Oxford's willingness to speak to the less friendly Fortescue was his undoing, quoting an old saying that a castle that speaks and a woman that will hear they will be gotten both. Oxford was taken into custody and sent to Ham's castle at Calais to be imprisoned indefinitely. John de Vere's part in the story of the Wars of the Roses was far from over, but he would be removed from action for a decade now. With the removal of this threat, Edward spent most of the remainder of 1474 planning an invasion of France. His alliance with Burgundy remained in place despite Duke Charles's tentative game-playing in 1471. Louis had masterminded the unification of Warwick and the Lancastrian cause, and Edward now felt secure enough to return his attention to the pursuit of revenge. The campaign would also serve to galvanise England behind Edward 
and allow any latent Lancastrian sympathies to trickle away. Nothing brought England together quite like an invasion of France. Henry V had firmly established the Lancastrian right to rule after his father's tumultuous reign by his famous victory on the continent. Edward now hoped to do the same for the Yorkist regime. In the pursuit of this aim, Edward was excitedly led by the Duke of Burgundy, who promised to begin waging war against the French at the beginning of the campaigning season, allowing Edward to arrive three months later and exploit the tired, bedraggled French. King Edward mustered what is believed to have been the largest force ever to have left England for France. Duke Charles sent 500 skew, low, broad Dutch ships, ideal for transporting horses and men, but it still took Edward three weeks to transfer his army across to Calais. King of England arrived to find no war. His brother-in-law, Charles, was far in the east laying siege to the town of Noose, where he'd already lost some 4,000 of his finest men. Charles had sworn to meet Edward with thousands of men, but arrived with only a small escort. This was not what Edward had planned for. Ever alert to an opportunity, the Spider King, Louis XI, sent word to Edward that he was willing to negotiate peace. He knew, he told Edward, that the Duke of Burgundy had lured Edward into France with false promises to his own ends and warned him that he would get little support from those he considered allies once they had seen their own objectives met. Louis had the measure of his opposite number. Comine, who had by now transferred his services from Charles the Bold to Louis XI, was present at the discussion in the French court and at Picigny, where a peace was concluded. He noted that Edward had changed a great deal since they had met during the king's exile in Burgundy, having put on weight and grown less handsome. Edward was fond of the easy life and Louis exploited that fully, offering him a huge sum of money to take his army out of France, a large annual pension and a marriage between his oldest daughter Elizabeth and Louis's son Charles when both came of age. Edward's councillors were also offered substantial pensions to ensure their compliance. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, did not agree with the peace. He refused to attend the negotiations and the signing of the Treaty of Picigny. The Duke clearly believed that Edward had a large enough force to press his cause on the battlefield, and Comines' amazement at the sheer numbers of the English force, however disorganised he believed they were, suggests that this might have been true. Richard was in the minority, though and on the 29th of August 1475, the treaty was signed, the two kings meeting on a bridge divided by a screen with holes in to swear their oaths to uphold the treaty, with Edward's other brother George among those at his side. Louis flattered Edward, even offering to entertain him in Paris and provide an amenable confessor who would absolve Edward of whatever carnal sins he may wish to commit while he was there. After the conclusion of the negotiations, Louis arranged a private audience with Richard, then just 22, and clearly spoiling for a fight and the glory that would accompany it. Louis gave Richard gifts of plate and horse, which the Duke accepted, but Louis, the master of knowing his enemy, was surely taking the measure of the King of England's ferocious brother. He probably found Richard a straight, intractable man, not someone who could be persuaded from his course as easily as his brother, and Louis no doubt took note of the young Duke. On the voyage home there was an important casualty, whose death has ever since been surrounded by rumour and controversy. During the short journey from Calais to Dover, the troublesome Lancastrian Henry Holland, Duke of Exeter, fell overboard and drowned. Henry's marriage to Edward's sister Anne had ended in a divorce in 1472, while the Duke was imprisoned. In 1475, he volunteered to take part in Edward's expedition to France to prove his rehabilitation was complete. Exeter had been a thorn in Edward's father's side before jabbing himself into the king's. Henry was a great-grandson on his mother's side of Edward III's youngest son, Thomas of Woodstock, Duke of Gloucester. He possessed some Lancastrian royal blood too, being a great-grandson of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, Edward III's third son on his father's side, though his descent was also through the female line. His death has been surrounded by rumour that King Edward had ordered him to be pushed overboard to finally rid himself of another long-standing problem. The last serious incident of unrest in the second period of Edward IV's rule came two years after the return from France in 1477. On the 22nd of December 1476, Isabel Neville, Duchess of Clarence, passed away aged 25, just two months after giving birth to a baby boy named Richard who would not survive his mother by very long. 
Her husband, George, flew into a rage, possibly fuelled by grief, but with dire consequences not only for himself. George became convinced that one of Isabel's ladies-in-waiting, Anchor at Twinio, had poisoned her at the time she gave birth, causing two months of degeneration and pain until she died. It's more likely that Isabel was taken by consumption, the name then given to tuberculosis, though it may have been an infection caught during childbirth. The Duke, though, would not be calmed. On the 12th of April, 1477, 80 of George's men barged into Ankarat's manor at Keyford in Somerset in the early afternoon. She was arrested and immediately removed to Bath. The following day, she was transported to Sirencester and by the third day, she was in Warwick, arriving in the evening after travelling some 70 miles in three days. She was thrown into a prison cell for the night and her daughter and son-in-law, who had followed her, were ordered out of Warwick by the Duke, spending the night several miles away at Stratford-upon-Avon. At nine o'clock the next morning, she was hauled before George, who accused her of murdering his wife. A jury, who would later insist that they had been threatened by the Duke, found her guilty with little semblance of due process. Before midday, Ankarat had been tried, found guilty and sentenced to death. The sheriff had her drawn through Warwick to the gallows at Mighton, where she was hanged. The affair was ugly and sordid, but it was also dangerous for George's brother the king. Clarence had exercised royal authority in a manner only permitted to the constable of England. Edward had forgiven Clarence his many previous indiscretions and betrayals, but a resurfacing of a lack of respect for Edward's position was something the king could not tolerate indefinitely. An astronomer named John Stacy, referred to indignantly by the Crowland Chronicle as a great sorcerer, was arrested for, among other things, using his black art to try and bring about the death of Richard Lord Beecham at the behest of his unfaithful wife. During questioning, which was undoubtedly conducted under torture, Stacy named another man, Thomas Burdett, as an accomplice. Stacy and Burdett were condemned to death and hanged at Tyburn. On the gallows, they were permitted to make a final speech, used by both to protest their innocence. The following day, Clarence burst into the council chamber at Westminster, provocatively bringing with him Dr. William Goddard, a staunch Lancastrian, and ordered him to read the final words of Stacy and Burdett to the council. It was rich for Clarence to denounce royal justice in this way, but it was perhaps his own innocence in the affair that he hoped to convey, or else it was a hypocritical open attack on the king. Edward, then at Windsor, summoned his brother immediately when he heard news of the outburst, having George arrested and placed in the tower on arrival. When Parliament met at the beginning of 1478, Edward himself presented the case for high treason against his brother. Parliament rolls record that a conspiracy against him, the Queen, their son and heir, and the great part of the nobility of the land has recently come to his knowledge, which treason is more heinous and unnatural than any previous one because it originates from the King's brother, the Duke of Clarence, whom the King had always loved and generously rewarded. George's involvement in previous rebellions was restated, and it was claimed that he had used Stacey and Burdett's death to try to turn the people against their king. Furthermore, Clarence also said that the king was a bastard, not fit to reign, and made men take oaths of allegiance to him without accepting their loyalty to the king. This charge was not entirely new, and seems to have originated as a joke at King Louis's court, where it was insinuated that Edward was the son of a huge English archer named Blaybourne, with whom his mother Cecily had engaged in an affair. It's likely that Warwick heard the story while on one of his many visits to France, where he was well liked, and used it to his own advantage. The story appeared once more to condemn George. Crowland recalled men being called to speak before the parliamentary trial, but found it impossible to distinguish between prosecution and defence witnesses. George denied all charges, but Edward insisted that he intended to bring war once more to England, and that George had kept an exemplification under the great seal of an agreement made between him and Queen Margaret, promising him the crown if Henry VI's line failed. There was to be no way out for Clarence this time. Whatever he'd truly done, Edward wanted an end to it. The Act of Attainder was passed. George was found guilty. On the 18th of February, 1478, George, Duke of Clarence, was privately executed, as was the right of his rank, within the Tower of London, aged 28. A rumour grew up and stuck that he had been permitted to choose the method of his own execution 
and in a final act of defiance, he has to be drowned in a vat of Edward's finest, beloved Malmsey wine. This story has been given some credence by reports that his daughter Margaret wore a tiny wine cask as a charm, a trinket that can be seen in a contemporary portrait believed to be her. Crowland reflects that Edward ordered his brother's death only reluctantly and regretted having to do it. He writes of a whispering campaign moving backwards and forwards between the Duke and the King, each hearing the other's every word reported and possibly exaggerated. The Queen's Woodville family have been accused of at least contributing to George's downfall, if not masterminding it. There's no proof of this, though later speculation claimed that Richard, Duke of Gloucester, blamed the Queen and her family for his brother's death. Dominic Mancini, an Italian present in London for the tumultuous spring of 1483, would write that Richard was so overcome with grief for his brother that he was often overheard to say that he would one day avenge his brother's death. This may have been the result of the application of a degree of hindsight, but it's clear that few, least of all Edward, were pleased with the outcome. Precisely what Queen Elizabeth might have had to gain would soon become clear. The same Parliament that condemned George Duke of Clarence also deprived George Duke of Bedford of his livelihood and title. George Neville was approaching 17 years of age, and although Edward had intended to have given the said George adequate livelihood to support the same dignity, the King had not delivered. Whether for lack of funds or fear of facilitating the rebuilding of a strong Neville affinity who would not be sympathetic to him, Edward set about another purge of threats. The Parliament rolls insisted that the lack of adequate livelihood often causes resort to great extortion, corruption and maintenance to the great trouble of all the areas where such a figure happens to live. So, outrageously painted as being in the best interest of both the Duke himself and all who live near him, all the dignities given to the said George or to the said John Neville his father shall henceforth be void and of no effect, so that George and his heirs shall not be dukes or marquises, earls or barons. George Neville was left with absolutely nothing. A few months after Clarence's execution, John de Vere, the pirate Earl of Oxford, scaled the walls of Ham's Castle and jumped from the top into the moat. The water was only shoulder depth and John was swiftly recaptured. It remains unclear whether this was an attempt to escape or to end his own life. John had been a natural Lancastrian but was also Warwick's brother-in-law and had supported the Earl's attempts to place George upon the throne before the re-adeption. An implacable enemy to Edward as much as a supporter of any other particular cause, all of his hopes appeared finally lost. It may have been an attempt to gain his freedom, but the timing makes a resigned bid to end his life possible too. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that reading and I'll be back with another one tomorrow.